Scobie has a book to sell. Yes, Finding Freedom is his one claim to fame. And he's decided to go on and write Endgame, which is apparently about how the monarchy is on its last legs. Prince William is ruthless, Charles is inefficient, Camilla is conniving, Catherine's just a wet blanket, that all the royals surrounding the British royal family, they're all terrible, horrible, collapsing people. It's a dying star. Yet Harry and Meghan in the United States, why nothing is wrong there. They are just perfectly fine, perfect in every single way. You can smell the BS in this article from a mile away and he actually contradicts himself and he doesn't even totally make sense in a lot of these instances and it's almost funny to see some of these big publications giving him a platform because he doesn't realize that they're almost leading him to his doom much like what's happened with Harry and Meghan. In fact really he's following the Harry and Meghan playbook to the letter giving us a sob story about online bullying and how oh it's so hurtful there's a tear in his eye. Well I'm like well guess what buddy that happens to all of us and me included so you know what I just get on with my life and just ignore it and just ignore the trolls and the haters. And I think some of the hatred that's towards you might be the result of your own doing in this instance. Because what Omen Scobie has done is he's attached himself to Harry and Meghan. And as their star has cratered, and as they've been calling out for lying, hypocrisy, all these sorts of things, he's getting dragged down with them. And he seemingly refuses to acknowledge any other wrongdoing while constantly hammering the monarchy on their wrongdoing. And now you can say on this platform, sometimes I do something similar, but I have criticized William and Catherine before on Twitter and even on here and I've gotten a lot of flack from that so I don't really apologize because I feel like I am an equal player here. I try to look at all sides of the equation but Omid Scobie his bias is so exceptionally clear that how can you say he's writing anything truthful when he's just so blatantly obvious in his bias and yet telling you oh no 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 you're reading too much into it. I'm not friends with Megan but I have a lot of friends who are friends with Megan. But there's no connection. <laughs> and I'm like, when he said that in the article, I'm like, what are you talking about? If your friends are friends with her, then obviously you have the inside track to her and nobody else in the monarchy. And I just find that stuff so incredibly grating that he complains about how he's treated and yet he obviously doesn't see the hypocrisy in what he's doing. So we're going to analyze this Times of London article today because I think it is awesome. And I also think it's awesome if you subscribe because we have a lot of fun here. We love talking about royals and royalty and all the chaos going on with Harry and Meghan. They are endless sources of amusement to people. And I know some people say, well, why do you cover them? I was like, well, it's a car crash mentality. <laughs> people watch them to watch them make a disaster of their lives. That's why people are so interested in watching the Harry and Meghan saga. Despite what Omid Scobie and others might say, it's the car crash mentality, guys. That's what's truly going on here. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. So it begins describing what Omid Scobie talks about in the book, that the House of Windsor is crumbling, the king is unpopular, stick in the mud, the queen is a ruthless operator, the Prince of Wales is a power-hungry schemer. The Princess of Wales is a wet blanket who really didn't want to appear on Blue Peter. And the Duchess of Sussex and her husband are all fine and dandy and with a bright future before them. So again, even the Times is kind of turning the screws to him. And it's just weird to watch somebody walk into their own career fall, basically. That's sort of what he's doing. And I will give his book a read. I won't I won't get a used copy or hopefully a publisher's copy. That's what I've asked for is a publisher's copy. But it just is interesting to watch somebody kind of subtly walk off a cliff here because Harry and Meghan associating them with them never seems to go well for anyone over a long period of time. It just seems to sort of end in an epic train wreck for everyone. So it's really best to keep your distance. And I think Omid Scobie could have had a pretty decent career as a real reporter, utilizing his connection to Meghan to get into the royals and then cover them more broadly. But instead of doing that, instead of taking that opportunity and really running with it in a good way, he's He's gone the opposite direction. He's like, okay, I'm going to attach my star to that of Harry and Meghan. But the unfortunate thing is once you attach yourself to that star and that star falls, your star fall starts falling too. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of his prospects dry up. So it'll be interesting to see because the thing is with Omid Scobie as well is nobody even within the royal reporter community likes him. Most of them sort of make fun of him. Like Richard Eden has been pretty scathing about Omid Scobie in the past and so have many others. And sometimes they'll go on his, his tweets and go, well, 
that's how it's done in every royal event. Scobie, why are you complaining about this one? It's done in every single royal event. So they all know this guy doesn't really have access and had a very minimal window where he was able to go on, I think, one or two tours, and those were both with Harry and Meghan. So really his broad experience here is very, very limited, yet he's using it to propel himself and propelling what he thinks Harry and Meghan's narrative is going to be. But as time has gone on, that narrative has cratered. It has crashed and crumbled. And there is a ground zero situation in its wake because things aren't going well for them. But if he continues to tell us, yes, they are, then of course we have to believe him, right? I mean, we ignore all the evidence around us. We just need to listen to Omid Scobie. And so they ask him in this Times article, are you a friend of Megan? And this is Laura Pullman, who is the author. He says, no, I'm not her friend. And I didn't interview her for this book. Does anybody believe that? I mean, you almost start off there with what many people consider probably a lie or misleading. Maybe they're not friends friends, but maybe they're acquaintances. Maybe they didn't interview her. Maybe he had a conversation with her. Again, the nuances of what he's saying means that he is not giving you the full truth here. And again, you see this throughout the interview and that he's kind of tiptoeing around things in a lot of ways to try to make his side make sense. And I just don't think any of this is going to help him, just like it has not helped Harry and Meghan. It's just Amazing, it hasn't helped them. Why do you think it's gonna help you? Okay, let's go on. So he says, I'm very aware that I'm quite disliked in Britain. The way anything about me is said is as if I'm just the absolute worst person. He tells me later tears appear in his eyes and he, you feel genuinely sorry for him. But honestly, I don't because I think the irritation with him comes from the fact that he's avoiding the obvious and yet trying to state contradictory things. He criticizes Catherine for something, yet praises Megan for the same thing. It just doesn't totally work. And him doing that, I don't think does himself any favors here. And I should have done this in a video on Twitter and I meant to, and maybe I still will, but you know, I would have criticized Megan for Catherine, her dress writing up quite a bit when she got out of the car at the South Korean state visit. We haven't seen that from Catherine in a long time. And so I kind of excuse it because I think, well, she must have not have realized how the car would get out because it really did ride quite high. And she had the long cape on and everything. And I'm sure she was thinking to herself, well, I have this long cape. How did this happen? And so I feel you there because sometimes you think you plan for all scenarios and all of a sudden something slaps you in the face. So I feel for Catherine there. But at the same time, I can also say those things and not like Omid Scobie who can't really say those things because he would criticize Catherine for that. And yet if Megan did that, oh, she's an independent woman. Look, she's showing you her legs or whatever he would say in that scenario. Again, I think that's where the frustration lies. Not just that they don't like him, not just that maybe he's the victim of online bullying, but that's kind of what comes with the territory when you become somebody who speaks out publicly on things, you become a target. And that is just what you have to live with. And so to say this, oh, sorry, oh, people aren't nice to me. I'm like, grow up. No, they're not. They're terrible on Twitter. Who cares? Just do what you do if you're passionate about this. But what I thought was really interesting is there was another comment because obviously he keeps kind of trying to go, oh, no, 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 read the book, read the book, and then you can have, you know, opinion on it or whatever. It seems kind of apparent to me as well is that he's, and somebody said this on Twitter, that he's probably not really all that confident in this work. And I don't think he is because when he initially wrote this, the fortunes for Harry and Meghan were looking better than they are right now, which is pretty poor. So he says he's not friends with Meghan Markle. And then he goes on to say, I have mutual friends with Meghan, not just a friend, friends. So you're obviously peripherally attached to her. And that definitely helps with getting information and breaking details. He says, but no, he's not on the Sussex payroll. No, he's not sleeping on the sofa at their mansion in Montecito. He's renting a home in the Hollywood Hills a long way from his upbringing in Oxford. So they did the pictures of him in LA as well. And so I was just wondering, it's like, so are you going to LA now? Are you following the Harry and Meghan dream? Because again, it's just all too convenient to not think, Oh. According to his sources, Endgame, H&M, as their staff call them. I would like my staff, you know, to call me by my name. That would be nice. We have to remember that this couple, that 
This is just my own opinion, not something he's been fed by Meghan Markle, which I'm sure he was. Seem to have bonded over their shared traumas, experiences, and battles that they face together against others. That kind of bond is much tougher to break than anything else. You know what's actually a better bond is friendship. Harry and Meghan have absolutely nothing in common. They're not friends, and he looks increasingly miserable with her. He cannot act, and she can. So I'm sorry, but I just don't feel like at all that anything you're saying, Omid, in this scenario is remotely correct. Because I saw Harry in the video that the Invictus Games itself posted, and the guy dropped the puck, looked happy, and then when he turned around, his face just totally fell. And he's, he's in front of people. He should be kind of happy because he's interacting with the public, and he's just not there. And then there's this video of him and Megan walking, I don't know where, and he just looks like a grump and she's grinning at the camera, trying to strut her stuff, having her little convenient and like stylish hand in pocket type of scenario. And he just looks miserable. And you can't mask that misery anymore. You can't tell me that this couple is in a great place because I don't think they are. So it says most readers though will be there for the gossip and Machiavellian backstabbing. Scobie does not disappoint on that front. William is a hot-headed company man who is increasingly comfortable with the palace's dirty tricks and the courtiers who dream them up. Scobie claims that it is William who, through his loyal aides and press relationships, has painted his younger brother as mentally fragile. Oh, the guy who admitted to doing magic mushrooms on television, in the interviews, like multiple times. We cannot guess that the guy is mentally fragile. Are you kidding me? William doesn't have to spread that. Harry is saying it. Like, seriously. Seriously. Harry is saying he's doing magic mushrooms to see his dead mother. And somehow it's William who's causing people to think he's mentally fragile. No, it's Harry. It is Harry and Meghan who are making him look mentally fragile. It's, it's, mm -hmm. Are you joking me right now? Okay, it goes on. The side of it that a lot of people don't know or within our industry have known but chose not to report is just how involved William has been in many things that have gone out about his own brother. Well, maybe that's so, but can you blame him? Because royalty at the end of the day, yes, there's some Machiavellian machinations going on behind the scenes. I have no doubt about that. So it does in Hollywood, the exact same thing. I don't understand why William is getting criticized for something everybody else does. And so William does it behind the scenes and Harry goes on Oprah Winfrey? <laughs> like what's more damaging here? Doing subtle things behind the scenes or it could be that the staff members don't like Megan so much that maybe they chose to leak things because they didn't like her, no incentive to protect her, wanted to throw her under the bus because William and Catherine are better bosses than they are. That's what's going on here. That's what's going on here. And it's entirely possible William and Catherine's camp was leaking things because they wanted to let the public know that the image, the facade that Megan was putting out is not correct. There, there are other things going on behind the scenes and that she's difficult, demanding. She's not this wonderful giving person that she likes to represent to the world. No, there's two sides to Meghan Markle. The image you see that she curates, carefully manages and controls, and then the side of her that's far less unpleasant. And we've had nothing but report after report after report of them being difficult to work with, challenging, their staff turnover is astronomical. That is a problem that does not go away. It has nothing to do with William and Catherine. It has everything to do with Harry and Meghan. So this is kind of dumb. Queen Camilla, now finally tolerated by the public, reportedly rolled her eyes when subjects such as gender identity or veganism come up. A former aide is quoted. So what? <laughs> like, oh, do you expect everybody else to have the same opinion as Meghan Markle? There are diverse opinions out there in the world. I know that's really hard for some people to understand, but there are diverse opinions on things. And that is actually a good thing. If we are all in group think, that's a bad thing. That's a bad thing. Even gluten-free or dairy-free options at a restaurant menu occur. So who cares? Who cares? I don't care. If that's a personality quirk she has, like, are there worse things in the world? Wouldn't you think a woman allegedly bullying a toddler? Isn't that like a more worthwhile damaging report than a woman who doesn't like a gluten-free menu? Who cares? Scobie claims too that when Piers Morgan called Megan Pinocchio Princess on Twitter X in 2021 after he, she had spoken out about feeling like she wanted to end her life, Camilla 
quietly thanked him for defending the firm. Well, yeah, because the firm needed to be defending. Harry, the firm had no outlet to defend itself. Harry and Meghan attacked an entity that does not comment on stories like Harry and Meghan were pushing. And because of that, the monarchy was totally vulnerable because they have no real recourse here. They just hope the public sees through the BS, which most people did. Most people did see through the BS Harry and Meghan were selling. Yes, it, it, it resulted in, in, in a hype for a bit, about that, but as time has gone on, it has proved again and again that Harry and Meghan are willing to do any, whatever it takes to gain attention for themselves. That little bump they had just continues to fall. So then it goes on to talk about, of course, Catherine. Cause you know, you can't like Catherine. I mean, he's not friends with Meghan, but you know, he doesn't like Catherine, so. Meanwhile, the Prince of, of Wales who has jokingly shivered on the mention of Meghan's name, who can blame the woman? Who can blame that woman? Apparently, Meghan Markle bullied allegedly Charlotte during a bridesmaids fitting. Why would you think Catherine would be jumping up and down to have a conversation with Meghan Markle? Like, I feel like logic doesn't apply to these people and it drives me bonkers. I was like, do you not realize you're like the instigator of your own demise here? Apparently not. She reportedly had to be gently coaxed into appearing on Peter Blue in 2019. In the coverage of Kate, we infantilize her massively. So the bar is always lower. Scobie tells me from his Hollywood pad. Again, very condescending. It's a very, very condescending. And just very backstabby and bitey and just, just mean-spirited. The small achievements that we've seen from the Princes of Wales wouldn't perhaps be noted if it was from another member of the royal family. But with Kate, it's like, wow, many Windsor watchers will raise an eyebrow at this depiction. Kate's public profile having risen sharply since Mexit. So this is going on not quoted. And not by accident, her campaigning around formative childhood years has been well received in many quarters. Part of the Wales' strategy now, Scobie says, is to take Harry and Meghan on at their own game and focus on winning over the US. More trips, more press, which ha must have Harry and Meghan quaking in their boots. Moment oh, Scobie, Catherine for the first several years of her marriage was raising her children. And yes, she didn't do as much as some of her peers. I've been totally honest that I have thought that and I think that somewhat holds true. But now that we see sort of the formation, the holistic view, she took that time with her children because she wanted to use that and understand them and give them a great foundation, which she is now using some of her experience as a mother to help guide the early years foundation so that they can hopefully raise the next generation of Britons and have this amazing connection between them. That is what Catherine is doing and I think that's absolutely incredible. And so it is going from strength to strength and she's been very cautious and I think the caution has been good because if you jump too far into things, then things can crash and burn. And does Omen Scobie offer anything that Megan has done that's significant? I mean, she's done some things, but she was also a woman almost in her 40s when she married into the British royal family. Catherine was in her late 20s, and her and William were leading a very different life to what they are now. So things change and things evolve. That's part of life. And what is Megan doing that's all important? She's going to Katy Perry concerts, Beyonce concerts, Taylor Swift concerts. Look at her go. Yeah, okay. And then obviously we have to complain about the Duke of York because the Duke of York does not get criticized nearly as much as Harry and Meghan, even though the Duke of York has lost essentially his whole life. It's still, Harry and Meghan still, I mean, they are the perpetual victims of everything. So looking at the monarchy right now, in Scobie's view, unless the world rapidly change, tack, the whole institution will shortly come skidding off its gilded wheels. We are at this pivotal moment in time where the future of the royal family as we know it is in a crisis. The crisis being a lack of interest from young people and apathy, a growing Republican movement, questions over whether the family still holds the morals and values of the crown that the queen did such a great job of. When you look at the cast of characters, it has been questionable. Um, well, don't you think it's been a bit questionable on Harry and Meghan's side too? I don't think Harry and Meghan can speak to family at all. I mean, they basically carpet bomb their entire families. So how in the world can Harry and Meghan have like the higher, higher play here? I don't think they can. I don't think they can. Again, I don't understand what he thinks this interview is going to help him with. And is he trying to be a real reporter anymore? Or is he carpet bombing that whole career? Well, I guess if he's living in Los Angeles, he's moving on from that. And... Good, because 
he doesn't really have a future there, I don't think. His assessment gets worse. For endless talk of modernization, the Royal Family Inc. is as resistant to change as ever. To stay relevant, the system, in almost a Trumpian twist. Of course, he has to put in Trump. And it's like, how does that, I don't understand how that helps you here. And you're deliberately trying to malign them by using a guy most people don't like, whether or not that's good or bad, doesn't matter. But you're using that to deliberately malign them in a way that is, I think, just childish. Leans on patriotism, even jargonism. What is wrong with patriotism? Shouldn't you be proud of the country you're from? Are we supposed to all hate our countries? I don't understand. Yeah, I don't understand that. To shore up its purpose, he writes, it's punchy stuff. Rather than ever facing or confronting challenging of modern times, whether that is diversity or other social issues, the institution of the monarchy regularly turns away from that and relies on support for things of the past as opposed to widening the following of the royal family. Here's the truth, though. Sometimes modernization is not a good thing. Sometimes it's not. And honestly, things that stand the test of time reflect values that have been infused in society for centuries. A monarchy should not be turning out a dime. Because guess what? When you chase after fads and that fad dies, then what are you left with? So think about, let's say, Hollywood and the Me Too movement. What the Me Too movement has resulted in is a catastrophic downfall of Hollywood and the Marvel Cinematic Universe because they thought they had this idea, well, we have Me Too, so we need to put more women into male-dominated properties, which the Marvel largely appeals to men. And so we'll do this, and guess what? Everybody will come because this works. What has happened? <laughs> Marvel's is gonna be the absolute worst performing film in history. You've seen this with Indiana Jones. They decided to put in a female Indiana Jones, not really introduce it well, and it didn't do well at all. It'll actually probably lose the company hundreds of millions of dollars. And I think Disney overall box office this year will probably lose well over a billion dollars. Every single one of their movies, except for one, has been an absolute flop. And that is because I think they overcorrected. That's what Hollywood does all the time. They overcorrect on things. And because of that, it ends up leading them down a, a bad path because we've gotten away from telling stories and now we have to sell an agenda. And that agenda oftentimes doesn't work. And so I see Harry and Meghan as a symptom of that. And so you want the monarchy to rush and change over to what you think is right? When the monarchy has stood the test of time because it is timeless value timeless things I think will help monarchy a lot more than modernizing because modernizing I think sometimes can lead you to ruin. You need to slowly evolve, not just automatically switch because right now, yes, how often throughout history were young people all that attached to the royals? I think most of the time it is generally an older generation thing because once you get older, you appreciate certain things more than you do when you're younger. And let me tell you right now, Omid Scobie, Guess what is going to happen in a couple years? George is going to turn 18, Charlotte's going to turn 18, Louis is going to turn 18, and the interest in the monarchy will explode again. I can guarantee you, once George comes of age and he is hot and attractive and tall, I'm telling you right now, the world's attention will focus on him. And then Charlotte, she'll be beautiful, she'll be wearing tiaras and jewelry, and she'll be the daughter of the king and the princess royal, and all eyes will go to the wheels as kids. The monarchy, yes, they're in a tricky spot right now, but the future is coming up, and the future does not include Harry and Meghan. Another damaging assertion is apparently growing chasm between King and his eldest son, who is in air mode, because he's the heir. I didn't think that was like rocket science. Prince William 41 knows his father's reign is only transitional. Scobie writes and is acting accordingly. The pair are out of sync, he says. It would have been nice to see them come together on certain projects, perhaps in the early years, to put on that united front, but they're working in silos, Scobie says, sipping from his bottle of Fiji water. Most other commentators say William and Charles have been become closer in recent years, but the bond strengthened by Harry's departure, 110%. I think William and Charles are very close. And I think what they see is they want to work on different things because they want to leave different legacies. And I don't see a problem with that. Why not leave different legacies? And William can pick up, or maybe his kids can pick up some of what Charles has done, but they're differentiating themselves. Who says they have to do the same thing? Things. They might see different avenues. They might have different visions for things. That's 
fine. And that's better because then William can build up his brand before he becomes king. And I think that's a good thing. He can't just rely on his father. He needs to build up himself too. And I loved how Homan Scobie says, well, he's power hungry. He doesn't have to chase the power, honey. He has the power. He will be the king. And that's not going to be denied from him. So don't know quite what you're talking about. So it says the king, a flawed father and a philandering husband who destroyed the life of Princess Diana. The Princess Diana for King Charles situation or Princess Diana and Prince Charles, deeply complicated. There were there was fault on all sides. I will just leave it at that. I don't think it's fair to say that Charles ruined Diana's life because she could have chosen not to marry him. She could have chosen that or her family could have chosen that for her. So sometimes you have to live with the consequences of your actions. Sometimes they're not all that pretty. According to Scobie, he demands that his shoelaces are ironed and more seriously, isn't relishing the job that he has waited for his entire adult life. I don't think so. I think Charles is loving every second of this. He has wanted to be the king for so long, not in a bad way, but he's like, he's been training for this job his entire life. He's so excited. He finally gets to do it. He finally gets to have this real voice now. He doesn't have to live constantly in the shadow of his mother. I mean, he still is to a lot of extent, but you know, he's enjoying it. I don't blame him. There has been a kind of realization of what the role is compared to being the Prince of Wales, where there was a little bit more freedom and personality. Scobie says, before Elizabeth II died, palace aides reportedly suggested Charles didn't have, in Scobie's word, the moxie or the vision for the family's next chapter. Well, he just didn't have Scobie's vision. Let's be honest here. This is all about Scobie and Meghan's vision. The monarchy cannot turn on the dime and Charles needs to have his own vision. And I think he does. Streamlining the monarchy and not having Beatrice and Eugenie as working royals was his idea. His, it was his idea. Come on now. So he talks a little bit about the, the growing conversations between the sides, which I think are very minimal and about how P William apparently still really isn't talking to Harry. And again, can you blame William for that? No. No, you can't blame him for that. I just, it just bothers me. It's like, does Harry not understand or does nobody in the Sussex side understand that action A will result in action B, not action D. It results in action B. If you tell about the family's internal turmoil, your own personal pain, calling out your brother, your sister-in-law, all these sorts of things, why would you think they want to have a conversation with you anymore? You're just going to put it in your next book. Why would they talk to you? This should not be rocket science, but apparently to Scobie it is because there's a great line down here. And I was like, I saw this, I was like, you two, you guys are out of your minds. Apparently this is the best line. It says in Endgame, Scobie quotes Harry talking to a friend who says, I'm ready to move past it. Whether we get an apology or accountability, who knows? Who really cares at this point? And he also alleges that Kate and her sister-in-law have had zero communication since 2019. For Kate, Scobie's right, there's no going back even in her relationship with Harry. So Harry and Meghan, for the longest time, have been demanding this apology. And now all of a sudden they're like, oh no, we don't need it. We're good. <laughs> Like VS, you're just ain't gonna ever get it. And you know it now. And now you're starting to panic because things aren't going well. Cause <laughs> no, whoops. Megan has no clue what she's doing and neither does Harry and they're floundering. There was a great bit about that too here, which I thought was really fascinating. He admits he knocked six years off his age. He says that was unfortunate and naive of me. You live, you learn. <laughs> and then it goes on to ask, he does look suspiciously younger than 42. Has he had work done? Ugh, people are obsessed with this, oh, Scobie size. I've not been under the knife, not done anything crazy. So he kind of has, probably. I raise my eyebrow. He then admits he tried Botox many years ago and enjoys all therapy, a non-surgical skin tightening procedure. He's hopelessly single and has his French bill dog Yoshi for company. Oh my goodness. So <laughs> why would you not like years off your, why would you knock years off your age unless you're excessively insecure in yourself? And especially for a reporter, who cares? Who cares if you're a reporter and you, you like, who cares what your age is? Like, I just don't understand. I just don't get it. I just don't 
understand him at all. I just really, really don't. That's just, to me, that's something I would never do because to me, it makes no sense to do something like that. Why would I lie about my age? Somebody can just figure it out. Like, that's just dumb. <laughs> this is funny too. Scooby gets offers to appear on various reality TV shows, but turns them all down. I'd become the joke that I think some people already want me to be or see me as. Yeah, he's already kind of a joke. Even the royal reporters make fun of you. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> This is awesome. Again, I love the subtle British digs here. And again, shows why Omen Scobie should not be doing interviews if he can't keep his story straight. So it says Scobie is the Sussex's unofficial biographer and is one of their keenest defenders. Earlier this month, the Sussexes flew from California to Las Vegas and backed by Gulfstream Jet for a Katy Perry concert. They were guests of the oil heir Michael Hurd. Here's the thing with private jets. I mean, obviously I don't fly on them myself. Hang on, I say. I've seen a recent Instagram photo where you look very much as though you're on a private jet. Okay, that was a private jet, but that was only going from LA to Palm Springs. It was very short. When I checked the Instagram again, the snap had vanished. Getting caught in a lie there, Scobie. Not very good. Not very good. And then he all goes on to say, Megan has never publicly said a word about the environment or really attached herself to anything to do with it, Scobie says. It's nice for us to believe that she advocates for the environment, but maybe she doesn't care and that's okay too. <laughs> R12, the Sussex's charitable foundation, made a pledge to become net zero by 2030. So what? Her husband's super into the environment and she says, well, I don't care about recycling at all. Like, that's just dumb. That's just dumb. Um. So it says, pop concerts aside, Perry, Beyonce, Twice, Taylor Swift, the Duchess has laid low this year. End game six, and no, no, no. We also have the fake paparazzi chase. Can't forget that in May. Can't forget that at all. They should have put that in there because that was pretty noteworthy. End game suggests that she has been actively avoiding further royal drama, even though she will be photographed and have those paparazzi shots shown the day of her father-in-law's 75th birthday or the day after the coronation. She goes on a hike, like... And she, she is drama. She loves the drama. A significant reason for skipping out on Charles's coronation in May. And also she was worried about not being the center of attention and being behind a feather or maybe another candle. And having to curtsy to her father-in-law and probably brother-in-law and sister-in-law as well. And maybe even her nieces and nephews. That would be funny. It's now set her up to launch businesses and more creative projects and no one can say that she's riding on the coattails of her royal connections because she has purposely tried to sever them. No, she hasn't. She constantly uses her title, the Duchess of Sussex. If she truly wanted to sever ties, go by Meghan Markle. Have the guts to go by Meghan Markle. She doesn't. She doesn't have the guts to do it because she, she doesn't have the skills. So she has to use her title. Every time she uses her title, it reminds us of the royals. You cannot sever the connection between the royal titles and the royals. They go hand in hand. If she wants to separate from that completely, then drop the royal title. Drop the royal title. That's the only way to do it. One source in the book says she's working on something more accessible. So I guess apparently everything she's done so far has not gone well. So now she needs to find something accessible for people. Something rooted in her love of details, curating, hosting, life simple pleasures and family. So basically she's gonna be an influencer. That's what she's gonna do because that's all she can do. A friend of Megan told Scobie that the former actress is busy working on creating something safe and timeless. Now here's the killer, which tells me that this project is in development hell right now. It says, I still don't quite understand what that business project will be because as I spoke to people while writing the book, it changed about five times. So she doesn't have a plan. Or she's thinking, well, that didn't work for so-and-so, so I need to do something else. I need to do something better. Oh, give me six options. I don't like any of the six. Like, it's in development hell, basically. Her priority is apparently business and philanthropy, as she told Variety. Not sure how that works because unfortunately, you actually do need the business to fund the philanthropy. Those things go hand in hand. But since Netflix added Suits to its catalog, the show that launched Megan's career has been a hit all over again. Scobie imagines there could be a cameo role for her in, in the upcoming spinoff if she'd ever bite. Of course she could, they need the money. She'll probably bite. She'll probably bite. So what about Harry who turns 40 next year? His focus, and this is what I was told by the team, is really building his work in the military space within the US. No, my military, Harry, is not your platform. My military is not your platform. You have a platform to do that. It's in the United Kingdom. My military is not there for your personal gain. It's not. It's not there for you to promote your image. That's not what it's there for. It's my military. It's not your military. 
Your military is an ocean away, buddy. And he says this vaguely. So again, they don't really have a good plan. But number one thing, Harry, to get through your thick head is that my military is not there for you to use and abuse to promote yourself. Go back home if you want to do that. Go back home. My military is not for you. You were not, you were not a US service member. So you need to find and go back to your own military. It's not the United States, it's Britain's. Go back there. There's a real potential there to grow something really impactful. Sure. There's also his phone hacking case against the Daily Mail publisher to keep him busy. The feeling for Harry is that he is one of the few people in the world that has the money to take this on and probably will lose money in the process. He also feels that having seen everything on the front lines and during two tours of Afghanistan, what does that have to do with his stupid phone hacking scandal? That this is a word that's not that scary. <laughs> Oh my gosh, of course, war in Afghanistan is infinitely more scary than taking on a couple of the British tabloid press where you can't even remember when things, certain things happen and they have to ask you constantly and you can't recall anything. That also happened. He's also probably out of any public figure treated the worst by the British press. So his feeling is that it can't get any worse. <laughs> yes, it can. Yes, it can. And he's not treated the worst. I mean, I think Charles and Camilla were treated pretty badly. Diana. William and Catherine, lots of people. But the problem for Harry is that most of this conundrum is something of his own making. And now we're trying to spin Spare as a success. This is awesome. Spare, in which the fifth in line to the throne wrote about his frostbitten penis and losing his virginity in a field, did Harry a lot of good in the US because it really reminded people who he was. No, it didn't. They made fun of him on Jimmy Kimmel and in South Park. Didn't help him at all. Did not help him in the slightest. It's not all blue skies in California though. The couple has become such a big talking point that they become caricatures in the US as well. Perhaps there is some apprehension from certain individuals to even consider working with them. Yeah, I think there is because nobody's sure they can trust them and Harry and Meghan are toxic caricatures of themselves at this point. Why would you go into business with Harry and Meghan? That's a huge risk for you. And it says, what about rumors spread by a friend of the royal family that the Duke is so miserable that he regularly sleeps in a local hotel? I know a lot of people that know them that are in their world or their base, and I've never come across anything of that sort, he says, pointing out that the couple have a massive guest house at their disposal. How would he know? Has he stayed there? Because he hasn't stayed on their couch, but he could definitely stay in the bed in their guest house. If you wanted to spend a night away, you don't have to go as far as some janky hotel at Montecito Town Center. Oh, that's just rude. Janky is the opposite of swanky. Well, does he know? Has he been there, apparently? And who knows? Sometimes maybe you need to escape your life, and so it, even if it is a janky hotel room, it's better than staying at home. That can be true, too. Harry's British posho social circle back in Britain shrank when Meghan appeared, and Scobie says it only continues to get smaller, as some of those friends who were also friends with Prince William have picked their sides. Well, that tells you a lot. If they picked the other side, that means Harry's side wasn't that good. He reportedly has a small group of pals in America. The narrative is that some of friendless loser now is all alone and only has his wife to boss him around. It's make-believe cartoon at this point. What Omen Scobie does there, which he shouldn't do, is basically almost confirm the narrative. Basically saying that, yes, he sounds like this, but he's not this, don't, don't worry. But almost, he's confirming it. When you're trained in PR and you're asked a question, let's say, why don't you like Meghan Markle? I don't say, well, I don't like such and such because of this. That's not how you do it in PR. What you say is, well, seeing how she's treated her family and her royal family, I just don't think she espouses the values of a British royal. Something to that effect. Or I think she has taken advantage of the British royal family. Something to that effect because you confirm the negative. What Omid Scobie did here, which was the PR mistake, is confirming the negative, which is confirming that in a way that, well, he wouldn't stay at a hotel. It's janky. Well. Sometimes people need to escape. Who cares if it's janky? If they talk all about he doesn't have, that he's friendless, he doesn't have friends, there's a whole that narrative. Well, that's just a cartoon, that's not true. But is it? Because you're kind of almost proving it by saying it. Because you're not giving us much details to actually contradict the negative narrative. Love this, before Scobie can scoot off to his personal training session because somebody is in California and somebody needs to look good now. I want to know if he thinks the royal family will win their fight for survival. Could William be our final king? It would take a lot to dismantle the British royal family, he says, but could William be the last king as we know it? Absolutely. He believes that the Windsor's reduced to tourist attraction is a genuine danger, but that such a fate can be avoided if they kick into gear. The book isn't hammering the final coffin. It's just a reality check, he says, smiling. So that is Omid Scobie and his comments. I think that interview was a massive mistake on 
personally, because he was caught out on a lie there, like a blatant lie. And yes, you can think, well, I don't fly on private jets often, just, just this one time, like recently. Well, it's just to Palm Springs from LA. I mean, that's short, who cares? Well, you do care because your reputation's on the line. That's the problem that Omid Scobie is having, I think, is that his re reputation is pretty trashed at this point and it's just continuing to get worse. And this interview does him no favors because if your whole premise is as that everybody in the royal family is lying that Harry and Meghan are telling the truth, don't get caught out in a lie because then it really does look like the royal family is telling the truth and maybe you're telling the lie. That is what Omid Scobie walked into. So I don't think this interview will age for him well, but I wonder if he's in California now, is he finally giving up being a royal reporter because he can't get access to anything anymore? <laughs> because we all know for sure William ain't offering him to go on any royal engagements, neither is Catherine, neither is Charles, nobody in the royal fold. And again, I will say he could have had a decent career as a royal reporter, but he's the one who decided he didn't want to do that and he's going to have to face the consequences. So guys, let me know what you think of this video and Omen Scoey's latest comments. I'd love to get your thoughts. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.